I'm Sharon Brick Kelly. Welcome to the Vodafone New Zealand Music Awards, where the heavyweight champions... Are... And that's the sound of music awards of the past. You'd start off with pre-drinks, maybe about three or four. You'd then go to the pre-drinks of the awards with the artists. You'd then go to the awards, drinking, sitting down at tables for hours. Then there would be the awards after party. Then there would be the after-after party. And then you never know. <laughs> so, <laughs> raucous... Definitely raucous, definitely a lot of celebration, but it was always at the big party of the year. You'd talk about it for months. And the winner is... Teeps! Well, the annual Aotearoa Music Awards were on last week, but who even knew? Number one... It wasn't at Spark Arena, there was no red carpet, it wasn't televised. So therefore, I guess the overall atmosphere was completely different. There was a really small ceremony. Charlotte Ryan is the host of RNZ's Music 101 and MC of last week's very low-key event at a bar in Auckland. And the other big key thing was there was a lot of discussion about alcohol and how much to drink. And there was more talk about uh, respecting each other and that sort of thing. And we all got a wristband that was, we were only allowed three drinks each, which was quite unusual compared to other musical ceremonies. Well, isn't it a shame that it has to change so radically? I think that we have changed as a society. I mean, even myself, maybe it's my age, but I think that changes did need to be made because I think there were some incidents at after-after parties, you know, that really shouldn't have happened. I think that Recorded Music New Zealand really wanted to, especially after all that's gone on in the music industry the last couple of years, I think they really wanted to just pull it in, you know, try and restrain what they can in a certain sense and not have any responsibility for that other behaviour that might have gone on. So how has it come to this? On the detail today, the chain of events that are bringing change to the music industry. We all know about the global Me Too movement. In New Zealand, that inspired the anonymous Instagram site. Then the Amplify Aotearoa survey that revealed poor treatment of young women and non-binary people. There was the creation of Soundcheck to make the culture safer the expose. Stuff's Alison Moore talks about her work exposing sexism and sexual harassment, and Massey University's Catherine Hode on the hard truths budding young music industry professionals have to face. But back to Charlotte Ryan. Beneath the glass ceiling is really the place where it started, oh. because that was a anonymous Instagram account and women would start sending in there, this is what happened to me. Um, that obviously heard whispers and said something needs to be done. No one's doing anything in the music industry, so let's, you know, let's do this. A lot of people got very upset about that Instagram account. There were legal letters sent to them. Amplify Aotearoa was the survey that came out in 2019 that was done by Massey University mm. And the things that it were re revealed was that basically a high number of women had been sexually harassed, mm -hmm. but on the other side, a, a, an even larger number of women felt that they, they didn't get equal treatment for various reasons. I think that report was so brilliant and so good and honest. If anything, I wish it would have come earlier. I've been working in the music industry since the early 2000s and I think we always knew as females that was the deal. You know, there were often events that I'd work at or, or things and I was literally the only female and there were 40 other males and I was okay with that. Really? Because that was just, well to be honest I was young I didn't know anything else. And did you experience anything that would be these days considered unacceptable? Yeah, totally. And not, I am very lucky that there was nothing serious that I could have gone to the police about. But there were little things, you know, often now and then. And I think that's why I've got the confidence now to speak up as a, uh, as a more senior person in the music industry, perhaps, and say, let's change this. Let's shake it up. Because when my daughter comes through, if she's going to work there, I don't want, you know, I want it to be spoken about. OK, what exactly is Soundcheck Aotearoa? Soundcheck Aotearoa is... From what I understand, it's a group that was set up. It's funded by different music industries. So um, the New Zealand Music Commission, New Zealand On Air, APRA, they're kind of like the main, and Recorded Music New Zealand, the main umbrella 
you know, parts of the music industry. We wanted an organisation to stand up and say, stop this, let's let's talk about it, let's put posters around the venues, let's like do something right now because this is horrific. Mm. We've got to stop this behaviour. And yeah, they were set up with the intention to do that. And have they? Have they achieved that? A lot of people think it's been a little bit slow. They think that if you travel over to Australia or other countries, they're a little bit more ahead of us. I had friends that were in Australia last year, and apparently they went into venues, you know, dive venues where lots of bands play. And the beer runners or the posters everywhere were just, watch out, we're watching you. You know, like, uh, don't do anything dumb or, we're, you know, we'll see you type thing. It was very in your face. So therefore the females or, you know, uh, the people who might be... Vulnerable. Vulnerable. They could see it and feel safe, but also the people, the predators, they'd see it hopefully and go, oh. I was I was hoping that, and a lot of people have spoken about this, I think an artist, Delaney Davidson, he even did this little poster, and it was this really cool sort of Maori eye, and I just thought, I imagine, oh, imagine if that's in every bar, that's going to be so good and people are going to know, but nothing like that's happened. Instead, what they're doing is a website that has resources on it, and I think they're doing seminars which run through the country, so... We at RNZ could take our staff there and they'd talk about um, sexual harassment and what's right and what's not. So it's not so in the bars. It's not we're in the dark places of the music industry yet. And that is really focused more on safety, the safety of people who might be, you know, young women, for example, or or non-binary people, rather than looking at how you treat people more equally in the industry so that they can develop their careers without having to sleep with the boss or whatever? Well, it's about safety, but it really should be about, and hopefully it is about educating the predators as well. You know, saying, actually, it's not cool to go up and hug that young 21-year-old artist if you're 50 and rub her side. But yeah, it is about giving the confidence, I guess, to the young people to feel empowered to go, no, that doesn't feel right. And if this isn't right, what should I do? Yeah. Shortly after Stuff's expose, there are various New Zealand artists like Anna Coddington, Beck Ronga, Anika Moore Lord, who sent an open letter out to the music industry calling for change, calling for... Um, professional boundaries to be drawn up and more diverse workplaces. It's really hard for them. I had such admiration for those women, like Anna and Tammy and Lord. It is, even though they're very powerful at the top of the game, it is really admirable that they came out. I wrote a piece as well. I felt nervous, but I think working at RNZ I felt secure because I thought, well, I'm, I could stay here. I don't need to go back into the music industry and work perhaps. I don't know. It's Because there's so many top dogs. It, it is worrying that it might influence your future career. You really? might be stigmatised with that, ah, oh, you're a troublemaker, you don't like have fun anymore, and blah, 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 you know. Also, my daughter had just gone to the school's rock camp, Aotearoa Girls Rock Camp, which is now called To The Front. And I'd, so I'd gone in there and seen 40 to 50 young females aspiring to work in the music industry. And then I'd also seen what was the music industry was like. So I was, I felt really torn. I wanted to encourage them, but yet I felt really strongly that things need to change. So I think I was just trying to amplify that message and say, yes, listen to these girls. They're not just being silly little girls or anything like that. Alison Moore's investigation into allegations of sexual harassment and exploitation in the industry broke nearly two years ago in January 2021 and triggered a flood of corroboration really um and interestingly if we're talking about the music awards i mean i interviewed as you'll know from the original piece um three very brave people who started off off the record and eventually decided on off their own bat to be quoted on the record which is enormously brave but i spoke to uh, a number of other people in the course of that investigation who didn't want to be named and who were only willing to speak to me on background and the number of times those people talked about harm that had um, happened to them at the music awards was quite stunning. It has been an unsafe place for many, many years. So if the people that run the music awards have had a think about that and decided that something uh, meaningful needs to be done to reform that event, then that's fantastic. The thing I find interesting is that often when we break a story like this, there are 
some grand gestures of reform made, which are often loudly touted by the industry or by the institution. They make a big noise about how they're going to change and this is the way they're going to do it. And uh, a lot of the time, nothing much eventuates. But I think, you know, it's a more subtle but probably more meaningful uh, indication that change is slowly happening. You know, when I was interviewing um, those three brave people, one of the people that was quoted in the article said that she had been routinely sexually harassed throughout her career. And when she told people about it, um, she was told, you're a label girl, that's your job, to be locked in a bathroom stall and, and, you know, molested, essentially. And that has been the attitude uh, in the industry for a long, long time time. What is it about this industry? um, What makes it particularly bad? It seems, you know, that it hasn't adapted in the same way as other industries. Well, it's a very patriarchal industry for a start. uh, And there are two main things, I think. Um, Number one would be the power differential. In the case of artists, these are people who've hung their career hopes on you know, progression through the gatekeepers who are the management and the labels who have long been dominated by men at the top. And so they're in a very vulnerable space. You know, these are young people with huge dreams. My daughter is a music theatre professional and those people whose life dreams are to progress in an industry like that are really vulnerable to the behaviour and the decisions of others. You know, if you don't have somebody working for you to advance your career and if you can't trust that person, you're financially vulnerable as well as personally vulnerable. So there's that, there's the power differential. And and in the story that, that we published, um, that was a really tricky aspect of it because... In some cases, we were talking about consensual relationships, although consensual on the surface, but with a very, very steep power differential. And it was important to be able to explain the boundaries that had been crossed and the and how that can affect both the mental health and the career prospects of a young artist. You quoted Possum Plows, who said it's it's not about one person being manipulative or a bad person. The industry thinks it's normal to hang out with young people yeah. and it's a, it's a small industry, well, yeah, yeah, in New Zealand it is, and a small number of people who control things and they're, yeah. they're the ones who are older and white and there's not enough space for diversity. Yeah, well, that's the second barrier that they're up against or or the second reason that this industry is particularly vulnerable to this kind of behaviour is that work takes place in bars and in venues with um, lots of alcohol flowing and potentially other things as well. You know, I mean, corporate New Zealand has a terrible problem with sexual harassment as well, but that's taking place in office environments, whereas this is backstage at a gig or in the green room or in a bar afterwards. And and these are spaces that women and non-binary people have to inhabit, otherwise they're not participating properly in their own career advancement. Mm. But it makes them particularly vulnerable to um, people with power, and that includes not just management but includes uh, artists as well. How do you feel about your daughter being in the industry, knowing what you know? Oh, terrified. Well, she's, I mean, I don't know whether I'm naive in saying that music theatre is a kind of nicer space. Mm -hmm. She's not trying to forge a a career in rock and roll, for example, but she's been raised by a staunchly feminist mother. So, What do young people expect these days from the industry since that damning 2019 report Amplify Aotearoa showed almost half of women surveyed experienced unwanted sexual behaviour and more than two-thirds said they were undervalued, overlooked and patronised by their peers. Massey University Music School senior lecturer Catherine Hode co-wrote the report. Doing that report means that I now have a document that I provide to my students as part of their course readings. 
I find particularly teaching at a university as well means we are teaching young adults who are going out into venues and who are playing shows and who are well aware of the issues. So just being able to have a body of research that they can talk about in relation to their own experiences and their own perspectives, I think has really opened up the conversation a lot more. There's not any kind of like magic overnight fix, but it's been really nice to see our students kind of actively clocking that and thinking about what they can do through their own work. So what do you say to them? I mean, do you tell I them think... to be, you know, <laughs> if, if they're already in the industry and you're saying they're well aware yeah. of what's going on, um, I mean, what more, what more can you tell them? I know, and I think that's that's one of the kind of um, the the great kind of personal struggles. I think I always talk to my students about the power that they have as this kind of next generation of music makers in Aotearoa that they do have the power to set the standard for how they expect to be treated and that they can also, you know, take active steps to manage that in the gigs that they put on. Um, and because a lot of them are also, they're not just performers, they're working in kind of booking and promo spaces. Um, so often talking to them and kind of supporting them in this co that they're already developing about how they want to see an inclusive music industry. Do you feel like there is some kind of progress? I guess in terms of the concentration of willing bodies, whereas people kind of previously have might have been undertaking things in quite a quite a dispersed, sporadic way, I think the kind of concentration through things like our venues and through Soundcheck has, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> I, think, mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of momentum there that might not have kind of like people might not have, have felt as empowered by previously. It's it's not an overnight fix, and I continue to hear stories about people's experiences that suggest there's still a really, really long way to go. Um, like what kind of stories, Catherine? Oh, just stories about people getting groped in venues, women artists being continually undervalued and objectified. It sounds horrible to say fairly standard, but that's the that's the kind of like frequency of the ways in which those discourses are articulated across media. You still get lots of young women and non-binary students coming through? So music education in Aotearoa at tertiary level, um, music is one of the kind of areas of study that is largely dominated by young men. Mm. And that's pretty consistent across every music tertiary program in the country. It's usually about a 60-40 split in favour of students who identify as men. And that's further pronounced when you when you delve into kind of areas of specialisation. So tech training in this country. So that's things like in production, sound engineering, both in live and studio context. Um, you're looking at a much higher percentage of young men in those those kind of areas. So that's something that I'm continually kind of trying to investigate is what are those pipelines from par- like primary and high school into universities. Yeah. Um, and that's, it's a really interesting point you make about why would young women want to move into those spaces and that's something that's come out of a lot of international research about, you know, the industry has a repu- has a bad reputation and that plays a big role in the decisions that young women and non-binary folk make when they choose what degree they're going to go into. Do you think there'll ever be a day in the music industry when everything is equal? I think, like, honestly, it's so hard to say. I think the... The longer I spend researching it, the more the kind of intersections of the way all these different factors continue to play out in the sector. I just, I don't know if one day it's ever going to be truly equitable. I would hope so. But I think gender is a massive, massive issue. And I think it's probably the most pressing one, justifiably so. But there's also issues of homophobia within the industry, there's classism, there's really severe problems with racism, ableism, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so in saying that, there there are a lot of issues, but I also don't want to undercut the the continued work and advocacy that's being done by people across the motto who do want to see a positive change and who are going to continue pushing for it. I hope I've emphasised clearly enough how important it was for those um, those four people actually who I quoted in my story to come forward because they were really the first. They were the first to speak out in either New Zealand or Australia. You know, they should be 
celebrated, I guess, for being willing to to step out and um, and try and find change for for other people. And you know, Sharon, in the um, in every single investigation I've done in the past five years, generally. Uh, the people that I speak to are not looking for revenge. In fact, nobody I've ever come across is looking for revenge. And in a lot of cases, they don't necessarily feel that I can help them or a story will help them with their situation. But to a person, what they want is for it not to happen to anybody else. So it's actually really altruistic work, you know, coming forward and speaking to somebody like me. Ali says the people she talked to for her expose say they're encouraged to see so many people, including entire teams from music venues, attending sound check training workshops and learning about how to prevent abuse and receive disclosures. One, two, tonic, radio. <laughs> this is our band and we're called Sound Series. And Charlotte Ryan says her own teenage daughter is having an amazing experience. Because to the front is this amazing, inclusive place. It's sort of what the future of, or what even now the music industry should be. But I think she's also very aware, her father's a musician, so she's very aware of alcohol at gigs and things like that, and we just try and talk to her lots about it. Mm. Um, but... Uh, yeah, I'm hoping that young people are just, you know, they've got Sanchi Kaltiroa and they've got those amplified stats so they are aware of it when they come through. But, I mean, aside from the, you know, worrying about whether she might be sexually harassed in some way, what about her opportunities? Because this Amplify Aotearoa report pointed to that, that, that young women and non-binary people, that their opportunities are far, far fewer mm. than men. I think that's why To The Front is so important because it's lifting them up already. You know, when I was a young girl at high school, there were no bands or, or any groups that I could have gone to, but the guys could have gone to the music room. You know, the space might have been them at high school, but for this, it's, it is empowering young people to come forward and get the confidence. And also, in, it's um, To The Front's like a week holiday. I guess you could call it like a holiday um, camp. camp or something like that. So every day they do different things and they get Soundcheck Aotearoa to come in and talk. And they also get a manager to come in and talk and all these inspiring people to come and talk. So they are going into the music industry so much more educated and, you know, they've thought about things than I ever did. What do the old guard think about all of this? I think some of them are scared because they don't, you know, I think some of them think it's rubbish. There's a lot of, you know, there is a lot of opinion out there, but I hope that they'll see and understand that it's actually going to improve things dramatically. Yeah. Why do they think it's rubbish? There was a word that was flying around and it was called witch hunt. And I even was accused of being part of the witch hunt with my, and I just hated that word on so many, so many levels kind of like they can't be educated. It's kind of like they've got a brick wall there. The, the fact that they can't see that there's a problem, that is weird. That's it for today. I'm Sharon Brett Kelly. The detail is public interest journalism funded through NZ On Air and produced by Newsroom for RNZ. You can get us downloaded free to your mobile device every weekday from any podcast platform. Today's episode was engineered by William Saunders and produced by Bonnie Harrison and Sarah Robson. And thanks to Charlotte Ryan, Catherine Hode and Alison Moore. Mā te wā.